Good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon, rather, one o'clock. Hey, Mark. Great to see you. Hope you're all right. Hey, Terence. What about in London, are you, Terry? Hi, Steve. Hi, Gus. I'm very well, thanks, Mark. Yeah, all good. Despite being sort of isolated and talking to a camera, <laughs> talking to a laptop every day, uh, it's quite unusual, quite surreal, actually, as I'm sure you'd expect. Spend every day sort of talking at, uh, at the computer. Oh, not too far away, Terry. Have you played before, Terence? Hi, Karen. Hi, Jess. All right, I'll give it a couple more minutes. I was a little bit late coming online, so sorry about that this morning. Afternoon, rather. On and off for a number of years. Is that at Ealing you played, uh, Terry? All righty. Well, a very, very warm welcome to the um, PRC and the PRU viewers today. Uh, today's session is coming live from London. I'm a PJ professional. I'm one of the three PJ golf professionals uh, that um, work for the On Course Foundation, delivering events throughout uh, the UK throughout the year. Uh, the events are absolutely fantastic. They're very, very well run, very, very well administrated. And the beauty of them is that we as professionals can coach complete beginners and, the, uh, and spend a lot of time with you um as well as uh, the established players um who can go out and play and then what we tend to do is we do the coaching in the morning uh, and we split you up into ability ranges and we, we embrace beginner golfers it's a big part of what we do hi carl nice to see you um uh, and then in the afternoon we play a format whereby beginners and established players can play together and really enjoy themselves so we exist because of you uh, we thank you very much for what you do and what you've done uh, we're here for you uh, at any time, uh, so any questions that you've got um, are always welcome, uh, and you can type them into the live chat here, or my email address is richard.harrison at roehamptonclub.co.uk, and I'll type that in here for you now, just while we're waiting for the next few people to come online. Uh, so any questions you've got about golf or anything, then you can always uh, just let me know. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, just type them into the live chat and I will respond to them. Uh, they really help the, the sessions go along quite well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about swinging with limitations. We've done an awful lot of coaching over the past uh, well, 12 years I've been involved. Uh, and we've seen a massive variety of, of injuries, disabilities, missing limbs and what have you. And we always get away around them uh, somehow. It doesn't matter what we uh, uh, what we what we come up against. Hi, Joseph. Um, we try and find a way of getting you to swing the club and make it work for you. Now we're indoors today because there's too much interference from the um, uh, the, uh, the wind outside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about what a set of clubs looks like and why we have what we have in the bag. So this is a classic set of clubs here. It belongs to one of my members at the club where I work in London. And you'll see here first of all, you've got four clubs with the uh, the, the, the covers on. They're the woods, because historically those clubs are made of wood. They've been made from metal for about 30 years, but we haven't found a better name for them. We then have the irons, which are here. And then we have the wedges, which are here. So the big, big uh, uh, noise for everybody. Everyone loves to look at the woods because they hit the ball most powerfully. So if I take out a driver here, it's got a huge head, big, strong club. It's the longest club that we have in the bag and it creates the most power. Now I'm working today uh, indoors with my military grade radar, which is this box down here. And then that all comes through to my computer screen here, which is gone a bit slow. So all the data from today comes through eventually. 
to here. And it gives me a simulated ball flight here, and it gives me some data here. So what I'm gonna do first of all, I'm gonna make a few swings with the driver, and then we're gonna look at the data. And we'll show you some quite interesting things. So, I'm gonna swim with one hand first of all, my right hand, get the club swinging. I'm gonna try and make a couple of shots with the driver now. So I'm set the computer up one second. Okay, so I hit that one there with one arm, and I'm not particularly strong. Obviously, I've got a golf technique. But here, just to let you know, that I swung that club there at 77 miles an hour, and I hit the ball 161 yards. I didn't hit it very well. It's gone a bit right of target there. Now, just to give you some idea of that, if I hit that at 77 miles an hour, the world's best players, let's see up here, swing that club at 113 miles an hour. Now, I'm talking there about supreme athletes at the top of their game. Um, now, the point I want to illustrate to you there is that having one arm on the swing does not reduce the power of your swing by 50%, as you might think it would do. What happens is the golf swing, because every part of the body is moving, then if we lose use of one of the limbs, legs, arms, or what have you, we can still play the game. And we've seen this a million times in the On Course Foundation. How many people have come to us with uh, very bad injuries or very bad uh, uh, operations and what have you, and we get them playing the game. Now, I reckon if I strike one a little bit better, there you go, 174 yards out of that one there now. So, and I got my club head speed up a little bit, up to 70, uh, to 80 miles an hour, and I hit the ball 174 yards. Now, just to give you an idea, the average length of a hole on a golf course is about 320 yards, right? Now, if you think I've hit one shot there at 174 yards, then I guarantee you we can get beginners with one arm to hit the ball about 150 yards on the early sessions that they have. It's remarkable to think of that. So the, the main emphasis of what I'm saying here is that if we lose use of one of the limbs, we don't lose a total amount of power from that. So that's the most important club in the bag is the driver. And if I get it moving around my body, I create power. So let's discuss what power actually is. And I'll just use one arm again, just for, for either demonstration. It's actually getting the arm to swing around the body and create some swish, get some, some energy there. And this is a very, very natural motion now. I swing the club around the body. And you can hear that swish there. Load of speed in that motion. And I must assure you, it's one of the very first exercises we teach a beginner, but it's something we would still apply to our very best players at the club here. We have many, many professional standard uh, amateur golfers who could play to professional standards should they want to. And this is an exercise we'll teach them to develop speed and motion in the swing. It's the first thing we teach any beginner uh, of the game, really. And so when we put the hand on the handle, we hold it with the hand on the side of the handle, very important point that it doesn't go under, because that makes my forearm into a weak position. It doesn't go over, because that puts my shoulder out position. It comes onto the side of the handle, should we be right-handed. And then we make this swishing action. And if you want to learn the game or play better at the game, that swishing action with the right hand is by far the quickest way for you to do it. Just pick up an implement or a stick and get it swishing around the body. Okay, so then if we look at, uh, that's the most powerful club in the bag. We then have a selection of these clubs. Remember I said they were cool woods because they used to have uh, wooden heads. And they hit the ball various distances and their heads become a little bit smaller and the shaft of the club, the length of the club becomes a bit shorter, so they're less powerful. So that's the woods cupboard. The driver, the first one that I hit, the big one, that's the, uh, we start every hole off a tee peg, so we can put the ball to the top of the tee peg, and that gives it a little advantage because the ball's a bit higher if you get underneath the ball a bit. Shots played on that same hole from there on are always with uh, uh, no tee peg. We then get into the irons. And again, they're called irons because they are actually made of iron. These are significantly shorter than the driver and therefore a lot less powerful. So you can see they're a lot uh, less distance there but they're a little easier to hit. 
So remember I hit my drive a moment ago, 174 yards. With a seven iron here, I might get 100 yards, then thereabouts. Oh, we'll hit that one pretty well. It's got 130 yards. So you can see because the swing is short, because the club is shorter, I can't swing it as quick. And so a longer club does swing quicker, even if we make the same movement. But on that swing there, it's going to say 69 miles an hour, and I hit the ball 131 yards. So when I'm on a golf course, we have uh, different holes for par uh, three, par four, or par five, uh, relating to the length of the hole. A par three is around about 150 yards. With one arm, I've just swung at that there, I've got 131 yards. So again, it's another way of proving to you, and we see this every single session. You can actually hit the ball an awfully long way with only one arm, and the golf course can be broken down. Now, obviously, I would hit the ball further with two arms, but the whole point of the On Course Foundation is that we find a way to get everybody to play the game, be it in a wheelchair, be it short-sighted, uh, blinded, be it... And I teach, I teach lots of blind children myself. We put uh, an audible ball, put a bell in the ball, and we get them to swing and hit the ball. They can do putting, chipping, and, and the long game as well. Um, so really, uh, the, the distance of a golf course, we can break it down, if we swing correctly. And this swishing action, I must assure you, is probably the fastest route to developing that speed and power. So then, if I move down to the, the lower part of the bag, and the golf course is the golf bag is structured to have a powerful club, the driver, and all the rest of the clubs work in sequence to hit the ball less distance. I'm then going down to my wedges now. There's three or four of these in most people's bag, a minimum of two. And a wedge has, look at that, massive, big face angle there, and that's to hit the ball high up in the air over a short distance. So, I then make my swing. What you should see now is this ball jump up and hit the ball much, much higher because of this face angle. It's a much shorter club as well, and I wouldn't get much distance out of this. Not my best. That was all right. Alrighty, so what we're seeing now is you can see my swing speed reducing. As the club gets shorter, my swing speed just reduces more and more because the levers in my swing are shorter. I'll explain that shortly. I hit that one 69 yards. Now, because that's not a powerful club, I'm not trying to hit it a long way, that's more of a, a distance refinement club in the bag, uh, which gives me a controlled amount of distance. So if you look at why certain clubs hit the ball, more powerfully than others. It's down to the length of the club. That wedge I just hit there is very short. My drive here is all the way up there. It's much longer. And therefore, the levers are longer. That's a small lever. That's a big lever. Little lever, big lever. Little lever, big lever. So the big, long club creates a much bigger motion and a bigger swing to create much more power throughout. And so what we have then is a set of clubs designed for uh, controlling different distances. Now, if you've got any questions whilst I'm talking, type them in now for me, please, and I'll use them as content for what we're talking about. So another way of uh, uh, developing tremendous amounts of power in the swing, and we do this with able-bodied golfers. So that's my driver now. So we do this a very, uh, an awful lot with our golfers, is we get them to stand with their feet together. And this is a brilliant way of understanding the balance in the swing. If my feet are together, I can't make too much movement because I'll topple off balance. So if my feet are touching here, it encourages me to stay quite centered. So whilst I make motion around the body, I don't want the body to tilt backwards or tilt forwards, I'll fall off balance. Now, if I were to swing with one leg here off the ground, that's another example of me swinging without wobbling. So if I make a swing here on my left leg, oops, get myself balanced first of all, up and through, you can see I stay centered. I don't fall backwards here. So I should be able to generate a reasonable amount of distance with one leg. And indeed, some of our best players for the On Course Foundation, some of our... Uh, 
best players actually have either one or no legs. So there you can see, I swung at 79 miles an hour, still pretty good club head speed, hit the ball 180 yards. So again, technique is much more important in this game than actual strength. So I've just used only one of my legs in that swing, and that was to balance off. So uh, if I'm learning from scratch, which club should I practice with? It's a great question there. And really, when uh, when we get uh, us uh, when we meet people for the first time for the Arms Course Foundation, the pros will make a judgment on which club you should practice with based on what your limitations are. Now, uh, ideally, we try and get the most powerful club in your hands first of all because it is so powerful and it hits the ball miles. And if we get all that distance on the shot, um, then people get hooked because that's what hooks all of us in when we first start. It's just seeing the ball fly uh, as far as possible. So if we can't get that club to work for you straight away, we then work our way down the sequence uh, and then look at sort of slightly less powerful clubs, which might have a little bit more help to them and get the ball airborne. But if you're learning the game at home for the first time or you're, you're due to come to one of our on-course foundation events and before uh, you get to one and the lockdown has finished and you get to the range, just go and hit anything. Just get familiar with the club in your hands and get familiar just swinging the club around the body. Because trust me on this, you only need one shot in 50 balls to fly up properly and you think, wow, this is a fantastic uh, game, this. And it's a very unusual game because it, you can break it down into lots of different uh, departments of how you enjoy it. And some people I know uh, just love going to the driving range and hitting balls. Some people like the sociability aspect uh, and some people get a great deal of joy from playing golf on their own. So you don't have to go and play uh, in competitions and what have you to enjoy the game. Um, so any form of golf that you play or practice uh, just breeds familiarity, and we recommend that. Um, now, in terms of uh, learning from scratch, um, there, there could well be a gap between uh, today and uh, the next On Course Foundation, whereby the uh, lockdown finishes, uh, and then you might have two or three weeks to go and just try golf in the local driving range. Uh, golf uh, driving ranges tend to be extremely friendly. They're very happy to have complete beginners there. Um, and they will lead you uh, through the process whereby they'll lend you a golf club. Um, and then you just uh, go to the range and just belt some balls and just get some uh, frustration because it's a very hard game. Um, but just go and try and hit some balls. So what I'd do if I was you, I'd take the club that they lend you at the driving range. And there's every chance it will be one of the iron clubs here. We then place the ball onto a tee peg. Now, to get the driving range, will be a little rubber stationary uh, thing on the ground, which you just place the ball on top. Now, Jess has asked the question there about uh, tee heights. Uh, very high for the driver. So you can see in my, my mat down here, I've got my driver tee peg there. That's what I teed off with when I hit the big heavy club. And then from the iron clubs, I'll tee off, off a, a lower tee peg there. So then what you do when you go to the driving range is you want to try and hold the club and it's almost best to hold it like a baseball bat so you wouldn't do what the professionals do where they link the hands here. Just as long as you look down there, you see that all eight fingers are in a row. You don't want any gaps. That's a disaster for golf. We call that the valley of death. You want those hands touching there. And then as you look down from this point of view here, thumbs on top of the handle. And then what you're trying to do, and this is the hard part, when we're giving you lessons, we really force you into position here. We try and get the left arm and the shaft of the club to form a straight line. Now, if that's the case, if I, my left hand is at the top of the handle, my right hand's lower, you can see my right hand and arm are going to go underneath to compensate a bit there. So I set myself up, the left arm is straight, the right arm goes under. Then from there, remember that swishing action we talked about, and that's how you should warm up, make a few swings, just swishing around the body. From there, Slow it right down. The temptation to belt it is massive. You stand there, you try to so crash this one here. You swing up. <coughs> you're trying to swing the club to this contact under the ball. That's a big important key there. Because that strike I just hit there, the club went underneath and the ball reacts to that face angle there and the ball jumps up in the air. Terence, do we use the same wrist movement with all clubs? Yes, because a lever is a lever. And what we're trying to do in a swing is create leverage and power. And that leverage comes from that sort of motion there, but to the side of the body. And so if we take um, 
they say the 12 or 30 different clubs that are in a bag and we swing the club and try and do it the same way each time the 40 or 13 different clubs and their shapes the length of shaft and the amount of face angle or loft angle that we call here should produce completely different shots for us now very interestingly the tour professionals at the, at the highest level of the game all balls travel the same height whether they go 300 yards or whether they go 50 yards so a short shot will go up and down an apex at about 100 foot a long drive will go way forwards and an apex again at 100 foot so you know yourselves from your military profession that launch angle how something launches or how it leaves the, the ballistics of a ball flight a gun will have you a bullet get the ball traveling to the target on an optimum uh, path plane trajectory and speed that's a good question. How do I know I'm standing the right distance from the ball so that when I swing the club, I won't miss it or top it? All righty. So Mark's making a great question there, and it's a great uh, beginner's question. Instinctively, when I want to hit the ball a long way, I don't stand in a small position. I sort of oh, I get on some space in here, and I'm going to give this ball such a belt, and you sort of stretch yourself away from it because you instinctively want that space to create power. But unfortunately in golf, that doesn't work because we're trying to get a smack at the back of the ball to propel it forwards. And so the correct distance from the ball is key. Instinct is that, but what's correct is that the arms hang in front of us. They don't lift up here. They hang down here. And that should give us a space here around about two hands. So one hand's distance, two hands distance. Now, it doesn't have to be super precise at two hands. And I set myself up here, as long as my arms aren't up, or they're not crowding into my thigh, as I stand here like that, that's more or less the right distance from the hands to the body. Now, Mark's question is, is incorrect in one way, because he said, how far do I stand from the ball? It's the same distance of the hands to the body for almost every club, within a, within a reasonable range. Where his question is absolutely correct is that for different clubs, we do stand a different distance from the ball, but we shouldn't really try and change our body to do that. Now, when I set myself up to a small club here, you'll see. Okay, so the ball sits on the seat right there with the driver. And that gets me that sort of distance from the ball. And the ball sits around about here with the wedge. So there's a slight difference there in the distance from the hands to the body. But not a tremendous amount. But the difference in distance to the ball, Mark's absolutely correct. Can you see that properly there? Yes, you can. The difference in distance from the ball is absolutely massive. But we're trying to swing each club similarly, even though they'll feel different. So as I swing, both those swings, the club swings more or less around the body, but from a very different starting point there. So there's no specific way we can say you have to stand sort of 27 inches from the ball, which is quite common, that, that sort of distance for... Uh, an iron club, about 27 inches from the ball. So it does vary club to club. And also the thing as well is what we've seen an awful lot uh, dealing with uh, injured servicemen is that we'll get them to stand a variety of different distances. If someone's injury means that getting them to stand close is helpful, then they'll do that. And so there's, there's very few hard and fast rules in golf when it comes to learning um, from a beginner. And what we do as coaches, we're looking all the time at which of the various different ways of doing it you will fit into best. Now, we don't always get it right first time, but eventually it will get you there. Um, and so, again, quoting one of my uh, great quotes that I've learned from the, from the time uh, working with the military, we improvise, we adapt, and we overcome. Every time you come for a session, we're trying our hardest to find the best way for you, no matter what your injury is. And we've dealt with uh, many of them over the years, uh, and we always find a way uh, of doing that. Mark also makes a point there about saying missing or topping. So, a miss is where we completely miss the ball, and ordinarily that means you stood way too far away from the ball and you're swinging too aggressively. A top is where we go and hit the top of the ball here, rather than utilizing that loft angle under the ball to create the height. So, whenever we make a rehearsal swing, remember the golf ball sits close to the ground, we have to get that swing. A little bit of contact with the ground, and that's why we use tee pegs. Because on my rehearsal swing, you can hear me clip that tee peg, and then on my swing proper, I'll try and get the club to make contact with the tee peg. That way, another club has gone underneath the ball. There, 
All righty. Any more questions about what we talked about there? Um, the, main, the main thing about uh, uh, what we're trying to say to anybody who's watching this for the first time is that we've seen so much uh, over the years uh, and worked with so much, uh, worked with so many people over the years for the Course Foundation, um, and everybody can play it. The whole the, the game is so accessible. It has a very fusty image, and sometimes people think it's unwelcoming, but quite frankly, a lot of golf courses are... are desperate for money now and so they've had to become welcoming they've had to realize that people want places to be welcoming um and so the golf course themselves are welcoming driving ranges are very welcoming uh and of course the on course foundation will teach you how to use those places if you've never played before uh and i would say uh, every every event that we do over a three-day period and we might, perhaps might do 10 in a year um of the three-day events i would say half the people who come to them, male or female, are complete beginners. And we love that because we can teach it right from the very, very beginning. Oh, that's a great question, Karen. Is there a club choice on the golf course? So you've heard me talk about the 12 or 13 clubs that are in the bag. Um, there are no hard and fast choices. And I'll give you an example of that. I posted a message out to my members recently on an email, and it showed the effect of wind on a golf ball. Now, you know the effects of wind on a bullet much better than I would do. Uh, the effect of wind on a golf ball. So a golf ball is only one and a half uh, ounces. It's 1.6 inches wide. Now, whilst I'm hitting that ball as hard as I can, I'm only getting about 170 miles an hour of speed on that thing. So a bit of plastic, 170 miles an hour, soon loses distance, soon loses power, and the wind really takes over and moves that ball an awful lot. So we, uh, we know that we lose an awful lot of distance hitting the ball into the wind, and we don't gain as much uh, comparatively by going downwind. So uh, there are absolutely no hard and fast rules, and you're looking for a range in which your club hits. Now, I know the range uh, on my uh, clubs, and it's massive. I have a huge range of distance. In the wintertime, soggy winters, I will definitely soften that range and expect much less out of the ball. Uh, and in summertime, I expect much more because the ball bounces and rolls a lot further. So a lot of it's down to experience. If that doesn't sound too vague an answer there, so you're a great question, Karen. Do we have to take a divot? Okay, uh, every time, if at all. So a divot, for the beginners amongst you, is making some grass fly out of the ground. If you type into YouTube and you watch the world's best players, not with the driver, the big club I talked about to, to begin with, they don't take a divot with that, but a divot is where a player swings and makes contact with the ground and sends a big patch of earth out of the ground. Because the ball sits on the ground, we have to make contact with the ground. And so the perfect amount of contact on the ground will move a little bit of grass out of the uh, earth. We certainly don't need a massive, big, chunky, thick divot. And the way modern equipment is designed now, uh, Terry, is that it's not designed to take a big divot anyway. So the answer to your question is uh, a shallow divot is optimum. All righty. Any more questions about what we talked about or any questions that you may have, particularly the beginners? Uh, about anything we've talked about. Um, as I say, to all the PRC and other PRU uh, viewers, um, come and join us anytime you like. You're more than welcome. Uh, it's a tremendous sport. It's good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health. Good for your rehab. Uh, gives you fresh air, a lot of camaraderie. Everyone's in the same boat. And the game is very cruel to us all. So even though, if you type in I don't know, Tiger Woods and type in Shank. Now, a Shank is a shot where a player swings powerfully hits the ball, and instead of it travelling forwards, it travels at 45 degrees off target. It's a dog of a shot. But you type it in, and almost every pro has been caught out hitting that shot. So the game is uh, amusing to us all, and it's cruel to us all. Um, so Tiger Woods, Shank, any of them, and you can watch them all play really, really bad shots. Of course, they only do it every now and then, but thankfully, someone's got a camera phone on them when they do it, so it makes us all feel a bit better. Um, so like I said, that's a long-winded way there of me saying that you know, the game is very, very difficult, um, but there's lots of ways of accessing it, uh, and there's lots of parts of the game which are very enjoyable. And I would say the, uh, the camaraderie, the, uh, the learning, and that's one thing we've learned an awful lot as pros and, and uh, all the other staff from the On Course Foundation, is just what an appetite you have for learning, uh, and also what an attitude you have for learning. Um, it's obviously drilled into you in the military. Uh, that you learn a certain way and you dedicate yourself to doing that. And we have more difficulty in dragging people off the range uh, when it's time for lunch and, and dinner or what have you, or our tea, uh, than we have asking them to come to the range. Always turn up on time, they always turn up early. Um, 
and they're enthusiastic to hit the balls, often to their detriment because they can hit too many balls, get a bit hooked into it, and of course, uh, the game's tiring. All right, well, listen, thanks ever so much for tuning in. Uh, you've got my email address there. Should you ever want to have a, a chat, even if we've never met before, just send me an email. Uh, we exist because of you, and we're extremely grateful to you. Um, if there's anything you want from us, then just let us know. We're always here for you. And in the meantime, I'll see you next Tuesday. Um, in fact, yeah, so Jesse just said, thank you, Rich. I started this from a one-day event. I met so many friends. Uh, I can tell you now from our side of things that we've seen dramatic changes in the mental health and the well-being, mental well-being of so many servicemen. Uh, and many of whom are uh, quite a bit older. And when they came back from campaigns, Falklands or uh, Kosovo, what have you, the duty of care uh, wasn't there for them. Uh, and so thankfully, albeit a bit late, they've come into the fold as well. And uh, really, we've got an awful lot out of the Course Foundation. So God bless John Simpson, who set the charity up. Uh, God bless uh, all of you who uh, we're here for. Uh, we, we wish we could do more for you. All right, well, thanks ever so much for tuning in, everybody. Uh, I wish you well. Uh, I'm on again next Tuesday, same time, one o'clock. Any questions in the meantime, just give us a shout. My extreme pleasure. Uh, we will do an event for frontline workers. Karen, don't you worry about that. Uh, we won't take much persuading, I'm sure. My pleasure, Gus, as ever. Nice to speak to you. All the best, everybody. Cheerio.